are uh, Black Chronicle with our new series called One on One, and we are honored to have Miss Marilyn Luper Hildreth, who I think is one of the most dynamic people out there. How are you doing today, Ms. Marilyn? I'm wonderful. Uh, Miss Marilyn, I, I, we want to talk to you today about so many things. I hope you have two weeks set aside. <laughs> <laughs> but you are living, walking history. You're, you and your family are dynamic. This great city and state of Oklahoma and our nation owes you personally, Marilyn Luper Hildreth, a, a big gratitude. Thank you. Of course, that goes with your mom and your entire family, Miss Claire Luper, is why we're here today. Your dad and your brother, all of you all, made tremendous sacrifices to get us here today. And I'm not going to keep preaching, you know, I'm not going to keep preaching. But what we're here today, Miss Marilyn, would you tell us a little bit who you are and, I, I, and we'll go from there. I don't know really what you want to know about me, which is not common news. I have, I was born here in Oklahoma City and born during a time that Oklahoma has so many segregated laws more than any other state in the Union. It was against the law for blacks to do anything. We could not live across 7th Street. We could not, of course you know, we could not ride a bus. We could go downtown and we could shop anywhere, but we could not try on clothes, hats, or anything else. As a matter of fact, my grandmother used to take a string and measure our feet and go downtown to buy some shoes. It was not a good time in history. And we here in Oklahoma thought it was like that all over the United States. Because many of us had never left Oklahoma City, so we didn't know anything other than segregation, discrimination, intimidation. That's, the, that's how we grew up and that's what we knew. But my story is very interesting. Of course, my, you know, my mother was a teacher, and she was a writer, and she, she wrote a play, Brother President, the story of the civil rights movement in Montgomery, Alabama. And she produced that play with the students from Dungey High School. In that audience that night was a guy by the name of Herbert Wright, who was youth director of the National NAACP. He saw that play and was so impressed that he invited mom to take only one student to New York City. And you know my mother. Of course I'm not going to take one student. If all my students can't go, none of them will go. He thought about it and said, okay, Miss Lupa, but we don't have the money. And they raised in the Spencer community and in Oklahoma City, set at dinners, blow pops, any other kind of candy, pickles, money to send a busload of students to New York City. And I'm so glad they did because on the way to New York City, and the older I get, the more I think that my mother had to be a genius because she plotted out uh, an itinerary where we would go up to New York through the north and then come back through the south. Well, as history records, most of us never crossed the state lines of Oklahoma because, as you know, the Dungy and Spencer was a very poor area. They had a lot of pride though, and pride in their students. So they were a step ahead of a lot of people. Well, we went to New York City. And on our way to New York City, we had the opportunity to go in a restaurant and sit down and eat a hamburger and drink a Coke. And you said, what do you mean? I mean exactly what I said, because here in Oklahoma, we did not have that opportunity to go in 
to restaurants and sit down and order a Coke or a hamburger and eat it. We could ride the bus down to town. And after we got through spending all our money down there, we could take a brown paper sack behind the store at Green's and either eat our hamburger or drink a Coke. But we traveled on the northern route. And Harriet Tubman said a little bit of freedom is a dangerous thing. They should never allow us an uh, opportunity to have that taste of freedom. Oh, we presented that play in New York City, and we did a good job. And then we had to come back home. We came back through the South, facing this age-old discrimination, segregation, and intimidation that we had left. And at that time, we realized we didn't like that. We didn't like that feeling that segregation gave us, that we were always second class. We were not good enough to pay for a Coke. We were not good enough to sit down and eat. We were not good enough to ride anywhere on the bus. We were not good enough to drink out of the same water fountains. So we were on fire when we came back. And we had an opportunity to negotiate with the Restaurant Association. And their thing was that they would lose too much money if they allowed blacks to come into their restaurants and eat. Their, their business would fail. So after years of negotiating that didn't work, I made a motion at the NACP Youth Council meeting that we would just go down to town to catch drug store and just sit there until they served us. And if you know my brother Calvin, Calvin's got character anyway, he said, oh, here we go with one of Maryland's motions. But we decided at that time to go down to catch drug store. It was 13 of us, 13 kids. So, 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 so hold that point, Ms. Barron. Okay. It's called the original 13. I yes. So. Uh -huh. who, are, who are those 13? I'm glad you asked me that. Arita Tolliver, Calvin and Marilyn Looper, Linda and Lana Pope, she goes by Yana now, Barbara Posey, Alma Posey, Betty Germany, Richard Brown, Gwen Fuller, Emma Edwards, and I'm close to 13, right? Yeah, I think, I think you were there. Yeah. What were the ages of the third original? The youngest was about five. <laughs> wow. Oldest? Uh, 17. I don't know if me being a parent now, that I would allow my kids, sons, to go down there to do a protest and sit in. I would be too scared to do that. What? See, protests in our community was not a thing that we looked at at that time. And we knew that the, the Constitution said it's okay for us to gather. And I think the one reason that kids were used in the city in demonstration was because adults could not take it. They would, they did, they would lose their jobs. It was a lot of variables that would go into it. Well, uh, that was August 19th, 1958. Yes. The day you all started to sit in the cat's drugstore. Yes. So as Calvin said, here goes my sister. <laughs> Marilyn wants us to go ahead and, and protest. Go sit in. Where was your mother when you made that? that and she was there. Was she happy about the motion that you made? And she said, you, have, you all have spoken. So what are we going to do? And at that time that Port Wood Williams was one of our neighbors, church members, lived in the area. He drove a group of kids there. Mary Pogue was, uh, uh, drove the second car. 
and we went down to catch. And we didn't know what to expect. We walked in there and sat down. Those of us that could get a seat. And I, I don't know whether or not you've ever experienced it, but when we walk in and sit down somewhere, whites had a tendency to get up. Oh, I have experienced Okay. That. So th that's what happened then. But we were determined to keep a, a passive, nonviolent resistance. No matter what, we, we had to study the doctrine doctrine of nonviolence, Gandhi, Ma, uh, Martin Luther King, because we would defeat our purpose if we became violent. At ke times, Kevin, tears would come to our eyes when we would see adults being mean to kids, spitting on us, thumping coffee on us, stumping our toes. But we had to do what the Bible said. A Clara Lupin turned the other cheek, and that's what we did. What do you remember of uh, the Cash Drug Store? How long was that, that city? How long did that? Only that three days, and then they opened up their stores throughout the country. So Cash was, was a national chain? Yes. Not just in Oklahoma City? Not just in Oklahoma City. When they opened here, they opened up in different parts of the United States, everywhere they had a store. Wow. It was like a war, that we were declaring war on segregation. So we went down to the next place, and the next place, and the next place. <laughs> we say until the walls of segregation come tumbling down. Oh, okay, so, so, so Maryland, 1958. How old are you in 1958? Oh, God. Nine or ten somewhere. <laughs> Nine or ten. Mm -hmm. Who was focused on a mission? Mm-hmm. During this, this moment of, of time, and you mentioned a gentleman, Portwood Williams. You mentioned he talked about temperament of, of young people, kids. Adults would not be able to hold their tempers nor lose their jobs and take care of their family. But I was told by Stan Evans, who we interviewed earlier, Stan said that Portwood Williams wanted his job not only to help get you there, but was to monitor when someone during different movements, whoever, kept their cool. If they mm -hmm. weren't keeping their cool, he would go grab them and pull them out of uh, yes. the movement. Yes. They could not participate in the sit-ins with, I say, a bad attitude. An attitude that would bring on violence to the other young people that were participating. Yeah, we had another job for them. They could make sandwiches and make telephone calls. <laughs> uh, we, uh, there's a, speaking of moving on to the next moment, next sit-ins or the next uh, protest for, for equality, there's two that comes to mind to me when that that's gives, I know that you all did a lot, but two is Johnny Browns. Yes. Uh, then, of course, Black Friday on October 31st yes. uh, of 1969. But I would like to talk about Johnny Browns. First of all, I, you know, I'm a born and raised native Oklahoma City guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, bless, and I, well, before we started this interview, uh, I said thank you. Thank you to you, the original 13, your Claire Looper, and Mr. Williams, and everyone a part of that. Because this guy here was able to enjoy life from your hard sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I love how you responded. You said, well, then we did it so you didn't have to deal with that. We did it so you guys could have the right way to live, paraphrasing you. And that's warm. You know, that's humanity, right? You know, it's so important that we as a race of people continue that thought process. Because when we realize, so goes one of us, so goes all of us. And I'm so glad, Kevin, that we sat down here in Oklahoma City because as a result of us sitting down, young people throughout this nation started standing up. Yes, they did. But speaking of that, Greensboro, Montgomery, Selma, those three in particular, but Greensboro, Greensboro being number one, for some reason, historically, or history shows that that city movement was the catalyst of the civil rights movement. And it, it started there in Greensboro in 1960, and we had been sitting in a long time before that. But it's only because 
I, I, I look back over history, and I think it's because Oklahoma City was a nonviolent movement. We didn't have a lot of violence here. And it was only because of the people in Oklahoma City, whites and blacks who were able to work together, I say, to pull it off, to make the change in this area. And we were not and we did not receive the notoriety that a lot of places did because of the fact that it was nonviolent. But we had the longest city in American history here. In, in what was that city? Which one was No, that? the longest. Oh, the longest. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Well, you know, John A. Browns, that one took uh, a little while, didn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. We had to boycott John A. Browns. As a matter of fact, that was a store where they didn't want you trying on clothes, only because you were not black. But they would take all your money. You buy anything. And we couldn't, it's hard to make people change until you start talking about their pocketbook. So we, we organized a board count of Jenny Brown and even took pictures of blacks that were going in. <laughs> because unless we can create pride within ourselves, unless you can feel the same pain as your brother, then it's a horse of another color. Black Friday, October 31st, 1960. Sanitation workers. Tough. Called your mom, asked Claire Lupa to help them for their cause. Better pay, better quality of work. What do you remember about black? What do you remember about Well, black, black? I remember the sanitation workers met frequently at Freedom Center. Because they were tired. They worked hard for their money to be to receive substantial pay. And that was a dangerous situation down there. Then I, I laugh at Reverend Reed all the time because Reverend Reed was on the front line and Reverend W.K. Jackson and Reverend Jackson was said, we praying. And they, Reverend Reed said, the trucks are still moving towards them. So we praying. <laughs> Reverend Reed said, I wish you'd pray a little louder. <laughs> but it, it was something. But that is the core of the movement and throughout this country people were dying and people were crying because of the injustices of the system they say that that march on the black friday was one of the largest marches ever for the civil rights movement, for the sanitation workers of all walks of life, black, mm -hmm. white, Hispanic, Asian, you name it, everyone was there in unison for the right cause. Isn't that something? As you see what it did, you see what changes it brought about. And you tell me that we can't change things? So, you mentioned W.K. Jackson. Uh, to my recollection, one uh the clergy leaders of this city at that time, yes. St. John Missionary Baptist Church. Yes. Reverend Reed, uh, I, it has been noted by Stan Evans that he was uh, at that time a junior pastor who was on the hot trail of being the guy. Uh, as uh, Stan Evans said, when he was at Fairview, he was a junior pastor. When he preached, they went. When he mm -hmm. wasn't preaching, they went somewhere else. <laughs> so so uh, Stan said that. Uh, who else? You, you, and, and now Reverend uh, Reed is a dynamic senior pastor, leader of the city at Fairview Baptist Church, as the senior pastor, mm -hmm. as we speak now. But who else did, did uh, during that time of names, who did you meet, Marilyn, back then? I know you met Thurgood Marshall. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I know you met him. I know you met a guy by the name of Roscoe Dungy, who was the publisher of the Black Dispatch back then. You know, your house, your mom, you had to opportunity to talk to, meet with every day, or frequently, names, I mean, of people. Yeah, well, then you didn't think about it, because, you know, like meeting Martin Luther King, or meeting, I tell you what, the real trip was. We lived on eight, at 1819 Northeast Park, okay. right around the street from Douglas. 
in a house, a two-bedroom house. Not a big house, but I don't know how all those people would get in our house. I don't know. And didn't have, we didn't have money or anything, but my mom would feed anybody. And I was like, wow, we. But who did I meet? I knew Daisy Bates. I knew Megger Everett. I had the opportunity to meet Thurgood Marshall. I mean, on and on. We had a protest here in Oklahoma City. And Moses, you know who I'm talking about? I do not. Moses that played Moses. Wow. Charleston Heston. Yeah, Charleston Heston. Came and led them a march. Moses? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call him. And he came down with uh, Dr. West and a group of doctors to lead the protest march. And history is funny, Kevin, because he and his wife came over to the house and they left their camera. And their camera cost more than our house. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wow, we. But over the years, we still maintained friendship. When he was out to the uh, Cowboy Hall of Fame, uh, Charleston Heston was sick then, and his family came in, his wife and daughter. They asked our family to sit at their family table because his involvement in the Oklahoma civil rights movement meant a lot to him. And she said he would always talk about that. Tom Sellers was uh, behind me. And the governor and them were in the back. <laughs> but most of your national leaders I've met. Because over 50 years, my mother took young people to the NACP National Convention. where They gave them the opportunity to be exposed to people far greater than we've ever known. People we would only read about in the papers. The NAACP, in your opinion. Mother was an advisor for the youth council. Mm -hmm. uh, we we interviewed Joyce Henderson earlier, and she stated how Clara Looper was the bridge of, of the capital of Spencer, which was Green Passage, as she affectionately called mm -hmm. and those young people with the Oklahoma City Black kids. Uh, NAACP is twenty twenty two. It's where it is today. Uh, moving forward, where, where, where do you, how do you look at that organization compared to then and now? The NAACP is the oldest, most feared organization in America. We, through the struggles that the NACP has been through, it's amazing that anybody survived. But now it's up to us to go back in and make it relevant to today's time. Relevant to today's time, social justice not civil rights movement, it's the social justice movement. All boils down to the same thing. And that is? Injustice. <laughs> <laughs> How do you look upon the, 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 the today's youth and our today's leaders of this new social justice movement? You have Black Lives Matter, you have all these other different uh, uh, people and organizations coming out for change. What, how, do you look at, how do you look at that? I look at it differently than a lot of people. I realize that these kids that are coming up now, these are our kids. These are our kids that are coming up. I think that as adults, we need to take a keener interest in the training of these young people. Because during the, the difference between that time and now, we could not go and protest without the training. Every meeting we had before we walked the streets of Oklahoma City, we had to talk about injustice and how we figured into it and what we could change and how we had to act and react, how we had to dress, how we had to talk and how we had to walk. There's some that says we did all of this fighting for civil rights and integration and, and this, to 
today's generation doesn't appreciate it. We wear our pants to our ankles and we, we run around doing things that we do. And we don't dress accordingly uh, when we rep represent ourselves. Is that just talk or how do you look at that? I look at it as I look at myself. I said, maybe we have not done our jobs well enough to help change the young people. Because I, you would be surprised at the problems that these young people are going through. And nobody is really taking an interest. The schools, like we had an opportunity to do plays and, and debate teams. They don't do that in the public school system. We did it at the Freedom Center and the NACP Youth Council where we were able to discuss current events and become a part of it. But until we take our kids by the hand and say, listen, we're going to have to do like the Jews on Friday evening talk about from whence we've come. Have them understand that they're kings and queens. They have enough to be proud of. That we, we will never accomplish the things that we need to accomplish until we realize that these young people need our help. Okay. During the sit-ins downtown, and I think we were at Anna Maud's protesting. And I don't know why, because I was... The, Always short. <laughs> in stature. In stature. <laughs> and this white guy threw a chimpanzee on me in downtown Oklahoma City. And I said, why is that man throwing a chimpanzee on me? But we had a group of young men called the NACP Commandos. Their responsibility was to protect a, a, a barrier kind of around the protesters because we didn't want anybody to get hurt. We don't know what people think. You know, during that time, it was nothing unusual for them to make threats. And I remember the FBI had to come get me from Douglas because they had made a bomb threat to Douglas. They should have left me at school because going out to Dungey, they almost had a record kill me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, you, 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 uh, you've said some things that, that really stands out, well, a lot, everything stands out. But something I wanted to ask you about, you all fought for civil rights, for equality. For equality becomes uh, integration. Integration, equality, one of the same uh, in, in some respects. So we get integration, we get civil rights. The civil rights bill passes in 1964, I believe, 64, mm -hmm. 64, 65. The, we start fighting for uh, equal equality with education. Here in Oklahoma, uh, as your mother stated, as I've done some research, she, she has been on camera stating that we have filed, the state of Oklahoma had more lawsuits filed on behalf of civil rights than any other state in the union. Mm -hmm. They used Thurgood Marshall, used Miss Ada Ada Lewis, no, Ada Lewis, Mississippi official. Thank you. In her in her case against the uh, University of Oklahoma, they used that for Brown versus Education mm -hmm. down the road. Uh, all spearheaded by your mother and the movement. In saying that, busing comes right. Busing mm -hmm. comes to integrate these great schools. There's pros and cons with busing. They, there finger are, plan. Excuse me. The finger plan. The finger plan, which was mentioned earlier, and. And, and we've had uh, others, uh, our owner, our leader, Russell Perry, stated the Black Chronicle years ago when, it, when integration busing was really going, he was against busing and the Chronicle was against it. They said that busing would come and deteriorate our neighborhoods, our commerce. You look at Northeast 23rd and this side of the community, commerce is not like thriving like the rest of this city. What's your thoughts on that? We have a long way to go. Now, the thing that aggravated me about busing was they took our best teachers from Northeast Oklahoma City and put somewhere else and gave us other teachers. 
but the teachers to teach you had to have a love for young people and in a lot of ways I think the community not only here in Oklahoma City but they kind of gave up they didn't have the necessary fight because it's hard when you fight and don't know what you who you fighting against you know what you're fighting against but you don't know who and just like this song say smiling faces yes <laughs> so it's it's been a struggle um uh, mohanan playing but i think that it's if we had not really had school integration, then a lot of our kids would have not known what it's like to be around people of all races. And it was so important is that we do go to the same table and sit down. Because you'll be surprised of what we can learn about people if only we listen. The economy of Northeast Oklahoma City is coming back. It's coming back. And we have young people that are determined that it comes back. That is true. That is true. And, and you know, I, I like integration. Because I really figured that if you don't know what's going on, you don't have no money. You got to go and find out and listen to somebody else that has it or the opportunity to get it. Then how are we going to compete? That's absolutely true. So let's, let's talk about Northeast Oklahoma City. And let's talk about a, a building that's at Northeast 23rd and Martin Luther King. And it's called the Freedom Center. Oh, 26 and Martin Luther King. 26, excuse mm -hmm. me. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. For clarification, Northeast 26. And, and now it's getting ready to be even expanded through the MAPS program. Is yes. it $30 million or is it $20 million? I can't At 28. Remember. How much? Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight million dollars. Uh, that is going to be uh, a beautiful facility. Uh, it's going to be a state of the art. Claire Lupa's Freedom Center, Civil Rights Museum. It's not a museum because a museum is basically by dead people. <laughs> uh, and Freedom Center has always been a place where the community could go, where the community could meet, where we meet on issues that were affecting the black community. And it has to remain that way. It, a place where young people can go and get the educational knowledge that they need in order to compete within the system. They taught, we taught young people a lot of things. How to walk, how to talk, how to eat, what to do when you travel, how to travel, how to read. It has to be an interactive community center. Well, you know, back again, I said that we don't have the plays and the debate teams and things that we had when I was growing up. But we did at Freedom Center. My mom would think of anything to debate on. Who has the most sense, a man with hair or a man without hair? I mean, just something to make you think. And you can tell that she came from a place called Hoffman, Oklahoma, which is in Ofusky County. And they didn't have, they were poor at this church's mouth. And that's why I think that she came up with so many remedies to learn for kids. She taught them how to type and on, on the sheet of typing paper, the keyboard. So whenever, if ever they got a typewriter, they could go to work on one. But they didn't have no typewriter to learn it. They had a sheet of typing paper. But it, it, and then she came out of a system where the books, were torn, the pages were turned, uh, torn out of the books, and they had to create their own version of how the story ended. Wow. Uh, you, 
saying that and speaking of your mom and things that's taking place, her creativity, uh, Brother President. Uh, what was Brother President about exactly? Martin Luther King and the Montgomery bus workout. Do you still have that screen with the, the, the play? Well, and not only that, when mom was teaching at the John Marshall, her students did a movie, Brother President, that, that showed at the Tower Theater. Wow. And we have a copy of, of that film also. Wow. And we have a... Uh, Will he, that be showing at your uh, Claire Looper Freedom Center when it opens up? Probably so. But I'm going to tell you something else, that um, we have... We started some years ago, five or six years ago, the Clara Lupa Legacy Committee. Because we didn't want her story to go unnoticed, or untold. We wanted young people throughout the city and nation to know why she was fighting for their rights. And I asked her, Kevin, Mama, why are you staying in this when people are so mean to you? When people talk about you, criticize you, abuse you, why is it? And she told me something I never will forget as long as I live. She told me the story about when her brother was a kid and got sick and they had to take him to the hospital and they refused to treat him only because he was black. She told me about Reverend Parker, W.B. Parker here. That they told him that he could become principal of Dungy if he did one thing, fire Clara Lupa. And so where do you get your determination from? And I, I laugh because it's kind of funny after you think about it. She said that her father they would laugh at her because she would tell people her father was a pilot. And they would say, Clara Shepard, your father wasn't no pilot. They don't have no black pilots. See, my father is a pilot. He piled bricks over here and piled bricks over there. <laughs> so she had a keen sense of humor. But what I think that was so, so important and why she was able to sustain and and create and deal with so many young people was because of her belief in God. She had a sign over her bed and a sign over her door going out of her house. And she made us all memorize it. And I use it frequently. This says, I believe in the sun when the sun does not shine. I believe in the rain when the rain does not fall. And I believe in a God that I've never seen. That's what sustained my mother. Very powerful. Very powerful. You uh, talked about uh, Clara Looper and her maiden name? Again. Shepherd. Shepherd. That's like the Lord is my shepherd. That's right. Clara, okay. Clara Shepherd Looper, okay. The, the, uh, you said something that, that I thought was very profound. People say that a lot now. Uh, flowers, I want my flowers. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you your flowers. You said, and I love her. You said, Claire, Luke, want her flowers. Why she while lived. She was living. Mm -hmm. and, and saying that, it seems like that she is being recognized now, Maryland, everywhere I look. I mean, isn't it amazing? She, everywhere I look. And, and you would think that it just happened yesterday, right? Meaning of her account, or what she has done in the movement. And saying that, how did you feel when the post office was named after downtown? United I never States? would have thought it. I never would have thought that I would live to see the day. The little black child from Hoffman, Oklahoma. Wow. What a day, right? What a day. What a day. And I, Kevin, every time I start talking about my mother now, I, I get tearful. I get tearful because I know the battles that she fought. I get tearful because I know the people that helped her. I get tearful 
because I understand better by and by. But I'm so glad she did. And I'm so glad that she had so many young people. When she got sick, she had a student by the name of Clay Wright that organized a telephone call with over 200 students on it. And they loved her. And I get tickled because I'd be in meetings and they were trying to say who she loved best. <laughs> and it's the craziest arguments you ever want to see. But she had so many students. I was out at a meeting and this guy said that, I know you don't know it because your mother never would, would have told you, but if it had not been for her, I wouldn't have had shoes to go to school. She was always about service, mm -hmm. you know, and I thank the Lord every day for her ministry because that was her ministry when she was doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, United States Postal Office building uh, downtown in Home City, Freedom Center, getting ready to have a $28 million capital infusion. Um, Clara Luba Carrier. 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 Yeah. That's absolutely correct. We, uh, my family and I were in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, beginning of the fall, and, and stopped in the Lorraine Motel, Smithsonian uh, Museum. Uh, I know you said museums for dead folks, but, but yeah, <laughs> we went to the museum. Phenomenal museum, right? And mm -hmm. I have had the honor to attend the African American Smithsonian. Yes. Museum, it, but the one in Memphis dynamic as mm -hmm. well. And I come around the corner. And there you see it. And there I see Miss 405424. Three nine four nine. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel? I was proud. Mm -hmm. I was happy. I took pictures of it. I was, I was just super proud. And I said, "Your mother, you shared. You and Calvin shared your mom mm -hmm. with the world. Thank you." So to answer your question, my wife said, "Oh, look, got to take a picture of it." I was proud. Mm -hmm. We were all proud. And so you, I want to thank you. Because through the other interviews, you were very important and part of the movement because your mom was listening to a baby girl. A baby mm -hmm. girl wanted equality. That, I'm sorry, I know that you're just like your mother, Miss Marilyn. They said you pushed the movement. You can't deny that. <laughs> so, I, in, you know, in closing, I, 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 I had a couple of questions I would like to ask you. Okay. Uh, you touched upon what you looked upon the current social justice movement. Uh, but uh, tell us uh, something about you that people don't know about Marilyn uh, Luper Hildreth. What is some, something about you that people don't know? And maybe it's easier for you to answer just two parts on that. Maybe. About yourself as well as your mom. I'll be interested in what people don't know, something that we don't know about that we just can't read and see about you and your mom. I, I want to know that. Kevin, that's a hard question to answer. Because our lives have been such an open book. And I don't know much people don't know or think they know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is your greatest accomplishment, personally and professionally? Marilyn, you. Oh, gosh. First of all, I really don't like talking about myself. I know. And I, um, I've, I've been very blessed because I was one of the first I was the first woman that they hired to go to work for Allstate Insurance Company. I've had many opportunities to, and, and many, traveled many places. And I think the, one of the proudest moments in my life is to see what some of the young people are doing now in Oklahoma City that we have. When I, when I see them, I see that this job was the poorest paying job in American <laughs> history. But it's well worth it because you feel, they say, how you going to feel on the inside? I'm going to feel good. Because when I see the young people making accomplishments that my mother worked for and, and Calvin worked for, I'm happy to know that Somewhere along the line, we touch somebody to motivate them to help somebody else. In fact, that's absolutely correct. 
Uh, you know, we stayed, we started this conversation off, and I thank you and your family, you and Calvin, because you know when you're a child, and you all were part of the movement, mm -hmm. so you were in, you were engaged, but you all were living that every moment. Mm -hmm. Your your mother went to jail 26 times. I mean, you went to jail 26 times. And you know they. Believe it or not, people in our own community would laugh at us because they would call my mother jailbird. Wow. Wow. And one day I asked one of them, I said, do you know why she's going to jail? For you. Uh, it's, two, yeah. it's 2022. There's some that say, why are we doing this interview right now? You know, that was 19... 58, 58. I mean, 60s. On. Yeah, they say, what, what, what are we talking about? Can we let that go? What? No, we cannot. We must not as a race of people. Because unless we understand where we've been, we never will understand where we're going. But, but we have kids in integrated schools. We work in every Well, they have, a, they have a thing known as a computer. <laughs> they can read. It's not... I don't blame it on the school system anymore. They say they don't teach black history. You can Google and find out about the struggle. Back again, we are going to have to go back to what our forefathers did and how that they took pride in their blackness. Because it was not all the time that we were black and proud. No, no. And when I hear people using the N-word, I just cringe. I cringe because I said they don't understand the struggle. And I think about a friend of mine uh, that got killed in front of his kids down in Mississippi, Megger Everett, trying to get blacks registered to vote. And I told a lady this yesterday. I said, have you gone to vote? Oh, I don't vote. I said, oh, please don't tell me that. <laughs> Because unless we vote, we are hopeless people. We have no say. And don't complain to anybody about the situation. If you're too tired to get off your posterior anatomist and go vote, then don't complain. That's right. Speaking of, uh, you mentioned uh, color and black. When you hear the term women of color, mm -hmm. women of color, what, what does that mean to you when you hear that? What, what's, what do you think when you hear women of color? When I think of women of color, I think about the Civil Rights Movement. Because in the Civil Rights Movement, we had women of all kind of colors. We had Indians. We had some Mexicans. We had different variety. And the spice of America is in the notoriety of its people. And women of color have made contributions that if we start right now, we never could end. In, in closing, speaking of that, speaking of women of color, you know, you have the woman of color as your mother, mentor, I know your mm -hmm. best friend. Uh, who are some other women of color that you've been impressed with in your life that you that come to mind that you can really impress with? Daisy Bates. Who is Daisy Bates, for those who don't know? Daisy Bates was from the advisor of the NACP Youth Council out of Little Rock, Arkansas. Her family owned a press, a, a newspaper, and they printed it out of the basement of her home. And when we would go down there, they, as other places, we received bomb threats and, and things of that nature. But she was able to maintain. Daisy Bates, anyone else? Ada Lois Sipia Fisher. Dynamic. Anyone else? Nancy Davis. And let me tell you something. I don't know if you realize, but Nancy Davis, Ada Lois Sipia, and Mom all went to Langston at the same time. Did not know that. Langston and University. Wow. A lot of history there. Yes, I think they need to capitalize on it, like I've been telling them. Well, it started with the Freedom Center, right? Yeah, I, I hope so. It started with the Freedom Center. I want to personally say thank you so much for taking time. The reason we were doing this is for all the obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. needed to be done. We wanted to document you, your mom, 
great. We love Claire Looper. Marilyn Looper Hildreth, we love you. And we wanted to talk to you about you. You lived a life that's very full and rich. And listening to you, you have stories that is just untold. And hopefully one day we can get you back. Uh, we look forward to exposing this to everyone who will take time to watch it. Kevin, may I say one thing? Oh. I just thought about it. When, during the Civil Rights Movement, it was nothing for people to follow us. And we had left for protest, and it, so uh, white men in the pickup were, were trailing us. You know, the can with, with guns and stuff. <laughs> So my mother, if you, if you ever watch her drive, she drives, she would herd. And she said, I'm not going to take you home. We're not going home. But what I want you to do is when I turn this corner, I want you to jump out and run up to the Posey house and just bam and holler and scream as long as you can, as hard as you can, so they will let you in the house. And mom turned that corner on 14th and Martin Luther King. And we jumped out. I said, Mom, we're not, we not going to leave you. She said, yeah, you're going to do what I see. And Calvin and I jumped out and ran up there. And the reason I mentioned that, that at her funeral, I started telling the story and couldn't finish. Because I never will forget. That was probably one of the scariest moments of my life because I said, is this the last time I'll see my mother? Where is she going? How can she get away from these crazy people? But God had a plan for her, and he brought her back to us. So I, I, just, I say that to say that we never know what God has in store. The only thing that we're responsible for in this life it's doing the best we can, but we have to work with. And with that, we'll close. <laughs> Thank you again. You're welcome. Anytime.